just someone saying that they have a problem is not really enough. You really have to validate what what they, did they try to do something already to solve that problem. Being surrounded by these entrepreneurs, I realized oh, there's a different there's a different way. You can actually do something that you really want to see in the world. So standard private support tickets. Everyone knows the tools, tools like Zendesk or Intercom. However, there is not really any tools to scale support when it comes to public support, community support. And also group group chats. What we're focused on is we're building this, this platform to help community-driven companies to scale their customer support and customer success. Today on the podcast, we have Ayush Tintaya, who's the CEO and co-founder of Marva. They do customer support for communities. Ayush has got a really interesting journey where she grew up wanting to be a journalist before realizing she can make more of an impact and have a greater dynamic which fitted in with her personality by working in startups. But what she decided to do is work for different startups to learn the lessons first. So when it came time to build her own, which is doing today, she could hit the ground running and really knew, know what she's doing. And one of the great stories amongst that journey was being the first employee at a company, which then scaled into 70 employees. Mar- so Iris is really honest about her journey and all the lessons from it. So I hope you enjoy this episode. We're the Bay HQ, and I'm Amma, and this podcast is brought to you with HPC Innovation Banking. So Iris, you've done so many things in your career already, but when you're growing up, what was the ambition? What was the dream? So when I was a kid, I mean, obviously as a kid, you change your mind every year or so, but for the longest time, I wanted to be a journalist because I liked investigating, I liked telling stories, and even though obviously now as an entrepreneur, it's quite far from journalism, but at the same time, I would say telling stories is going to be important in, you know, whatever, whatever you do. Um, and when I was in uni, I studied international relations. So at that time, I was also very much thinking about potentially taking a, taking up a job in government or NGOs um, because I really wanted to make an impact. However, I realized that while I still want to make an impact in the world, doing that through like a government or NGO just doesn't necessarily suit my personality because I'm pretty impatient. I'm very action oriented. I like having an idea and executing on it, which of course is very difficult if you're part of a very large organization. Um, so that's why I just decided ultimately to go more for the entrepreneurial route. So when you had that transition, think about like journalism and because you did quite a lot of that at university, right? And working in different areas there. What was your first job out of university and why did you pick that role? Yeah, so my first job out of university, I joined a very small startup out of Amsterdam. So I grew up in the Netherlands. And what we were doing was um, we were a SaaS company. Uh, in short, it was like Google Analytics for physical retail stores. Um, and how did I end up there? I would say it was mostly because of the internships I did before. And um, one of the internships that really shaped my entire career path after, I would say, is um, I joined an organization in Amsterdam called Think, the Amsterdam School of Creative Leadership. And what that was about, it, um, it was an educational program for senior leaders in both corporates as well as more um, entrepreneurial and social entrepreneur uh, social entrepreneurship. Yeah, this program was teaching them all all around um, leadership. So for one summer, I was surrounded by these people that were all like really inspiring. A lot of them were running their own companies. They were super passionate about what they were doing, and that really shaped me because I felt wow, these people are so excited about what they're working on every day. That's what I want. Uh, Whereas, you know, when you're growing up, you're surrounded by adults and most people, they're complaining about their job or a job is some, it's very very much, you know, you just do do it because you need to make money. Um, And being surrounded by these entrepreneurs, I realized, oh, there's a different, there's a different way. You can actually do something that, you're enjoying and that you're passionate about and that you really want to see um see in the world so yeah being 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 there doing my internship there that really sort of put me on the entrepreneurial startup path um did, did some other internships and other startups after that and realized that is the environment that I that I really liked like one of the other startups I was with was um a company called Optimizely a uh, Silicon Valley based SaaS company. So from a, from the first 
or from the outside look, you might think, okay, it's not 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 the most exciting product because it's B2B, B2B SaaS. However, again, just being in that company, I realized, okay, what I like is that people were excited about their job. They wanted to, they wanted to do a good job. Everyone was motivated versus, again, growing up, being surrounded by adults, having, hearing them complain about how all their colleagues are putting in minimal effort. Like I would not want to be in that kind of environment. And I realized, okay, in startups is very different, um, which is what really appealed to me and what attracted me into the startup field. You mentioned a couple of times about the adults around you when you're growing up being quite negative about their jobs and what they're doing. Did you still feel maybe that pressure, because you said about working for governments and things like that, to get into that safe kind of role? Or were you encouraged to maybe think outside the box and explore the startups that you did? Or was that you going against the grain a bit? Definitely very much going against the grain because I grew up in a village and uh, most people, where I'm from, most people stay in the village their entire life. And it's just not something that they wouldn't consider like moving abroad. It's just not something that comes to mind. It's just not an obvious choice at all. At the same time, it wasn't that I was forbidden or discouraged from doing it. It was more just something that wouldn't cross most people's minds. You took a couple of roles in growth hacking, right? And I feel like you grew very quickly from leaving university to taking on some quite senior roles. And that stage of growth hacking, it seems like a really interesting role to take on. What were you doing in those kind of roles? And you're obviously managing quite large marketing budgets at that time. Could you explain a bit to audience, like what was that period like and how did you grow so fast? Yeah, so um, I've had different roles in the past. Um, at the start of my career, very much focused on marketing, digital marketing. Um, what really helped me, I think, were a couple of things. One was that I was lucky to do one internship that taught me very specific and kind of deep skills when it came to analytics. And um, because of that internship, I gained quite specialized skills, which is always useful. I think it's when when, we, when it comes to marketing, we sometimes talk about T-shaped marketer. Um, it's very good to have very specialized knowledge about maybe one or two areas, but but also have a little bit of knowledge about everything else, especially if you're interested in joining an early earlier stage company where you might have to do everything. So yeah, I I I I gained some specialized skills, but then obviously also being in early stage companies, I learned a bit about everything and how I was able to like progress. Again, it's a bit about taking taking risk and joining earlier stage companies. It doesn't always work out, you know. The first the first full time job that I had after university, that's company didn't really grow um had a lot of we had a lot of issues also in terms of culture it wasn't the easiest easiest or most fun fun <laughs> place to to be at so you know but I no regrets uh, it was an interesting interesting learning and when I joined the company obviously I joined it because I saw potential um and you you never know uh then one of the companies I joined which is which is when I moved to to Hong Kong um was a fintech startup called Needs. Um, we, we built a digital bank. I was the first employee there. Again, taking a bit of risk and doing that because I believed in the founders and I believed that that idea could work in the market that we were in. And that paid off. Um, we grew to about 70 people when, um, yeah, when I left. So that was obviously a really good experience for me, seeing that grow from just myself and the co-founders to being a skill up uh, with a sizable, sizable team, and obviously because of that, I got a lot of opportunities to, um, to 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 start building my own teams, managing people, try a couple of different roles. Um, some of it was not necessarily planned because in that company we also made a a small pivot. We pivoted from a B two C product to a B two B product, which meant that when I got hired, I was hired because of doing the marketing, digital marketing, which is very important when we were thinking about doing this B2C proposition. Then we pivoted to an SME proposition, uh, which meant that partnerships were much more important. Sales became more important, um, which was great for me because it gave me exposure and um, exposure to new areas and also, you know, helping me figure out what I like to do and what I'm good at. So actually now I would say that I enjoy doing the partnerships piece Mm -hmm more uh, than <laughs> necessarily the digital marketing but yeah if you join an early stage startup you get a lot of a lot of opportunity but it's not for it's it's definitely not for everyone because there's a lot of uncertainty and i would say one of the other things that is can be the one can be very challenging about an early stage startup is that 
you are working really hard on something and you might realize after a couple of months that it's not working and you have to you have to be very um very decisive and just be okay with okay this is just a sunk cost we have to move on we're going to try something else and it sounds logical but when you're in it it's really difficult because you've spent so much time on trying to make a specific thing work and you feel that you might feel like let's just try a couple more weeks let's push this a few more weeks let's try a couple of other things we're almost there but you just have to be really honest to yourself okay no this is probably not working we have to change change course um which i again did with my current company where we made a much larger pivot but i can go into that later but it's really interesting that, that you joined a company in another country as the first employee like you said and you've done work for multiple early stage companies how are you picking the founders what were you looking for to say this is somewhere i can grow yeah. what traits were you looking for in them for a couple of things i would say first of all especially if it's so early on it's definitely a bit of you know connection and you have to have a good gut feel about the person because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them so it to well, to trust your intuition um <laughs> but then also obviously people's backgrounds matters of course we hear about stories of people dropping out of school and building really big companies but those are typically the exceptions not necessarily the, the rule and also even though those companies can hyper grow i mean it's not necessarily the easiest place to learn if you want to learn from someone that has done it before that is really experienced uh so in the company that i joined as the first employee the ceo is very experienced um he'd been he actually he came more from a corporate background um but obviously very experienced in building and managing teams for example which is something that i that i've definitely learned from and just dealing with people and because again if you're building a startup managing dealing with people is like one of the most important things uh so yeah background intuition and obviously also believing in the market and the idea and believing that that makes sense um and yeah as you said quite quite a big jump another country first employee but um just a bit of background when i originally moved to hong kong i took up another job first which was a digital marketing job in an e-commerce company but i was only there for a couple of months because i realized pretty quickly that it wasn't exciting enough for me cuz the com- it was not a big co- it was not a corporate or anything it was still it was an established startup let's say but i realized okay we're not we're that, that company we were already about 40 or so when i was there and my job was like very specialized i was running um their digital ads in social social channels and i felt okay i'm doing the same thing almost every day which is wasn't satisfying for me personally and am i right in thinking it was part of the company from hong kong where you then moved to london right that's Started right so that. yeah how i ended up here is the um digital bank they sent me to london cuz they wanted to open an office in london uh we had quite a lot of clients in europe that were doing business with asia uh so they, so we we wanted to establish a local presence here yeah did, did moved here uh, set up that set up the office quit a little bit sooner than originally planned i would say a couple of reasons for that one of the big ones was probably covid and covid didn't necessarily affect that business but it was more affecting me personally being in a new country and um covid started pretty soon after i moved to london uh, which is really obviously very bad timing because i didn't really know anyone here yet i felt i felt pretty lonely and i just wasn't feeling that well um like personally but i think those things do drive you to make big changes and <laughs> so no yeah I, ultimately i think everything worked out well um but it didn't go as planned necessarily but even that decision to move to london to set up the office it's not a big decision you took in life there right and what was behind so obviously it's part of the company strategy but it didn't have to be you right i guess if you said i don't want to move to london i want to stay in hong kong and do some gas business they might have allowed you to do that um yeah so for me it was always my plan and so th- therefore it was actually this worked out quite well because what i was always thinking is that I want to take um uh for example a European or an American startup that is growing I want to start up their Asia office because I was already in Asia at the time. So that was what I had in my mind originally because I felt that would be a very good um learning ground for then doing my own startup after. Uh the opportunity that came up was kind of was the other way around but yeah. still very very yeah very similar in a sense. And I think yeah these opportunities are very 
very good experiences. Um, if you want to do a startup, like joining an early stage startup or perhaps, you know, taking a, f- a foreign startup to the local market. I think those are yeah, excellent training grounds for then starting your own company after. So once you quit this job, did you already have the idea of what you wanted to do next? Or is it a case of a bit of soul searching? Um, so when I uh, quit the previous job, I already had an offer from Antler. So some mm. of the listeners might be familiar with Antler. So what they do is they are, they're sort of an incubator, but a bit different than a traditional incubator. So you go there by yourself. If you have an idea, that's fine. You can also go there without an idea. They select people mostly based on, on background and relevant entrepreneurial experience. Uh, the idea is to find co-founders pitch pitch a, a business, work on it. And if they like it, they invest in the businesses that come out of the program. Um, so yeah, joined Antler. Didn't find a co-founder in Antler, unfortunately, but did meet some of our earliest annual investors through through Antler. So in, in that sense, still very much worth, um, worth, worth, worth going through it. And even in general, I would say the quality of the people in my program were, was pretty good. Cop definitely some people there that I could work with in terms of personality and skills it was more that actually going back to did I have an idea of what I want to do it was more around we I didn't necessarily find anyone that had the same interests as me in mm-hmm. terms of business ideas to, to work on and we when I originally joined Endler so some of the ideas that I was thinking about were um, given that I have a fintech background some of the ideas were related to fintech um one of the things for example that i was thinking about when i was in the program was how to get more women to invest which is something that a topic that i think is still very interesting i didn't decide to pursue that because after doing more research i figured the problem is very much education and the solution is probably more in education than necessarily a tech platform, whereas I wanted to build more like a scalable tech business. Um, but I think something is, a, something is a very interesting topic. So yeah, I joined Antler, didn't find co-founders. When the program was over, because I already set my mind doing, on building a startup, I ultimately ended up finding my two co-founders via um, job boards. So when I tell people, they're sometimes a bit surprised or telling me that that's a pretty big risk, working with people that you meet on an online job board so um of course it is but at the same time I also don't I, I don't think it's a crazy risk because what you typically do is I, I posted an ad I originally first I first met my first co-founder uh, Richard or actually I got quite a lot of replies to the ad and then Richard was the one that I felt okay um has he has a very interesting background and we get along we have the same same vision of how we want to run a startup. So we and so we were like, okay, let's just try working together for a couple of weeks, see how it goes. After, you know, after that one, well, we formalized it. But again, I would say the risks are limited in a sense. Um, of course, you've got you've got an opportunity to cost your time, but in terms of business risk, because typically what you do is when you work with co-founders, you've got like a vesting schedule. So, you know, if one of one of the two or one of the three um decides to quit within a month or two. You you haven't really lost anything in that sense. Um, but yeah, luckily it worked out for us. So after Richard and I got together and we decided what we wanted to do, we decided we started looking for a co-founder, um, found Ben again via sort of online um online search. And yeah, we've been working together ever since. So that's been almost three years now. And um yeah, we've gone through quite a lot. We've gone through a, a major pivot, which is not always an easy easy thing to navigate through. So I would say that, you know, you really have to trust your own instincts when it comes to finding co-founders. Because I also know plenty of people that work with people that, you know, they've been friends for 10 years or 20 years and it still doesn't work out. So you can't necessarily judge based on how long you know someone. Or (laughs) We hope you're enjoying the episode so far. We just want to give a quick shout out to our headline partners, HPC Innovation Banking. One of the biggest challenges for so many startups is finding the right bank to support them. Because you might start off and try to use a traditional bank, but they don't understand what you're doing. You're just talking to an AI assistant or you're talking to somebody who doesn't really understand what is you've been trying to do. HBC have got the team that have built out over years to make sure they understand what you're doing. They've got the deep sector expertise and they can help connect you with the right people to make your dreams come true. So if you want to learn more, check out hbcinnovationbanking.com. So one of the interesting things is that when you've got a new person, you're a bit more objective. Whereas when it's a person you've been friends with for 10 years, you've got all of the other history wrapped up in the relationship, which I mean, 
by meeting Richard and Ben when you did, you could ask the quite straightforward questions. Yeah, I mean, and there's pros and cons, right? Um, of course, if you've... Ideally, I think having worked with someone, that is ideal. Friends, you don't really know how they work. It can be quite different, like working together <laughs> versus being friends. Um, so yeah, I would say going in with a clean slate, being objective, asking each other the right questions, that is a very good thing about working with new people. There's, of course, also some advantages of working with friends. I would say one of the things, for example, is that if you're working with close friends, probably you're just going to tell them the honest truth if you don't like something. Whereas with new people, like now we know each other well, so we would tell each other if we don't like something. But, you know, if you're just started working together, you don't know each other that well, you're maybe still in the beginning, you're maybe going to be a bit more polite. Whereas mm. to be efficient, you have to be a bit ruthless in a startup and tell each other if, if something isn't working or if it's a bad idea, um, which can be easier, I think, if you know someone for, for a long time. And obviously you went through this major pivot with them as well, which has been really interesting because you all have to agree to pivot in some ways. Could you tell us what was the original idea and then what was the pivot and why did you pivot? Um, so originally, because all of us have fintech or finance backgrounds, we were working on an app to let um, let people invest in alternative assets, and we focus on collectibles, so things like watches, whiskey, art, and the idea was that users could buy a fraction of these assets, and a lot of these assets have gone up in value over the past the past decades. Um, so it was it was an investment proposition. Uh, we we built the product, launched it, raised some money for it, but ultimately. Had a lot of challenges, which is why we decided to pivot. So a um, couple of things it was very difficult from a regulatory perspective. Cost of acquisition, marketing spend, fairly high in general when you're launching new sort of fintech consumer apps. But even more so because the, the timing wasn't ideal. You know, when we went into market, that was just when all of the markets were going down. Um, not many new retail investors looking for new opportunities. So um, also the VC market going down. So we figured, okay, we can spend all the money that we have left. We can make a projection about how many users we can get. Probably it's not going to be enough to raise our new round, especially in this kind of environment, which, yeah. Uh, so I would say deciding to pivot and agreeing to pivot, that wasn't that wasn't really the difficult part because we all sort of agreed at the same time that it was the right thing to do. The more difficult thing, I think, was around when we then wanted to pivot, um, not only agreeing up on what to do, but also how um, there, there's you have to strike a balance between taking action because you don't have unlimited time. Every month you're spending it's money you're spending money and you have a limited as a startup you always have a limited time um, so being action oriented but at the same time not being reckless and making sure that it makes sense and you've done enough research to have conviction into the, to, to the next thing um because how we how we approached it is we looked at our own pain points building the first um First, for the first product. In that product, there was also a Web3 element because we were linking NFTs to physical assets. So we got very deep into the space. We saw, because it's a new space, we saw a lot of things that, we saw a lot of inefficiencies, things that weren't working well. So we had plenty of ideas um, and we just went back to like first principles and doing the basic customer research, talking to a lot of people, um, validating that they experienced Pain po specific pain points. And what, what actually made us do Mava, which is what we're doing now, is um, so what we're building is a customer support platform for community-driven companies. And what we noticed is when we were talking to prospects um, about, about Mava and customer support area, a lot of them, not only did they say that they, had, that they experienced a pain point, they actually, they actually tried to do something about it. When we asked them what other solutions they tried, they were able to tell us Perhaps they tried something like Zendesk, but it didn't work. And they would explain to us why it didn't work. Or they told us that they tried some specific bots for maybe Discord or Slack. Again, they would explain to us why it wasn't really sufficient. Whereas some of the other ideas that we were um, exploring, people said, yeah, that's very annoying or that's really a problem for me in my work. But then when we would dig deeper and ask, and I would ask them, okay, what did you try to do to solve this problem? Or what solutions did you look at? They wouldn't, they didn't really have anything to say, which is 
this is also just like a, I would say a recommendation or a tip for people that have an idea. Um, just someone saying that they have a problem is not really enough. You really have to validate what, what they, did they try to do something already to solve that problem? Ideally, they already paid money to try and solve that problem, but the current solutions don't work, uh, which is, yeah, which is luckily we we stumbled up an opportunity where that was the case. But, um, you know, you have to start building before you have full conviction because you can only talk to a limited amount of people in a limited time. So that I think was the main challenge where us as founders, of course, you have, everyone has a different personality. Um, so we did have some differences of opinion in terms of, guys, let's just go, let's just go and build this versus we only talk to five people. That's not enough. You cannot, yeah, you can't build a business if five people say they want this product. Um, so that was a bit of a balance to, to, to strike. So I really like that advice you gave there as well about, because a lot of people have the idea and they ask people, people like, oh yeah, we'd love this. But like I said, they haven't actually been trying to fix it and they haven't paid any money to it. So by validating it in that way, obviously it's such a big advantage in what you're doing today. And once you made that pivot, what were the first steps you then took? Because obviously you had to explain that pivot. You had to, like, almost you burnt some of the other marketing because you now got a different product. What were the steps you took to hit the ground running with a new product? Yeah, a few things that we had to do. Um, just from a practical point of view, <laughs> obviously we had to inform R because we did have users in the previous product that actually invested money. So we had to make sure that we'd handled that well. We refunded we refunded everyone. Um, and also we just had to be transparent in our communication about what happened. Then, so when I'm saving investors, those are the retail investors. Then of course, we also had our VC investors that we had to explain to that we no longer have conviction in this business that you invested in. And we had to get their blessing and their permission to make 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 the pivot um and that, that that was another thing that was challenging because on the one hand you want to get as much of their advice and help as possible but on the other hand you don't necessarily want to go to your investors that the first day that you decide with your co-founders that you're going to pivot and you have no idea yet what the new direction is so again we had to strike a bit of a balance there we didn't want to wait until we had a perfect plan because we also did want to get their advice and their input but we did want to have like a little bit of an idea of these are the potential directions that we're thinking about and there's a reason and why we think that, that these things could work and uh, yeah then we started building um our cto is amazing he's very fast <laughs> which is what we need in, in a startup so we got our first beta product out like very, very quickly. Um, yeah, got some people to use it. Again, I think that's really important. We, what we did is we ran the product for about a year without charging for it because the product in the beginning was very basic and it wasn't, wasn't that good, but we rather wanted to have people use it than waiting to launch it. So what we did is we just launched it very basic, but people could use it for free. And once we felt, okay, now it's a bit more mature, we've got the features people need um then we started charging for it which was a couple of months ago and how we got our first customers just yeah very much a personal network to start with but also just doing a lot of cold outreach that moment there where you switched on the payment side and the premium features was there any worry there because i know a lot of people maybe they initially have a free product and they kind of keep delaying starting to charge for it because they're worried about it how was that process for you when was it like this is now the right time when we, you know, started onboarding customers, even like the free ones, we told them from the beginning, we were very clear that this is going to be a paid product at some point. We also talked to them to do research in terms of what would be a fair price, what, what would be an expensive price. We just all asked all the typical sort of pricing, um, yeah, pricing questions. We weren't that worried about churn because at the time that we turned on the monetization uh, we already had several integrations so for customers to switch it's their switching costs because you know you have to change all of, we, we integrate with your discord with your website with your telegram um so by that point the product was already fairly sticky so how long has it been going now since so you've got the last two months and have you been happy with the results what's the what's the ambition now like where are you heading towards what's the dream for Marva? A lot of things that we're working on, of course, like <laughs> like any startup. But um, yeah, so as I mentioned, what we're focused on is we're building this, this platform to help community-driven companies to scale their customer support and customer success. A lot of our early customers have been in the Web3 space and we started out with like Discord integrations, Telegram integrations. 
Next thing is we want to um, yeah, tap into new verticals. So um, for example, uh, dev tools, AI tools, SaaS companies, we're seeing a lot of them are moving towards or already have customer communities on forums or on Slack or, or on Discord as well. So we're seeing a very big, very big opportunity there as well. And um, yeah, so, so, so what we're really seeing is that there are plenty of tools to scale your standard private support tickets. Everyone knows the tools, tools like Zendesk or Intercom. However, there is not really any tools to scale support when it comes to public support, community support, and also group, group chats. Um, again, another area that we think is potentially a very big opportunity. Now we're seeing a lot of B2B SaaS companies. What they do is they open Slack connect channels with all of their customers, which is great because it's very engaging and you, 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 you build this with close relationship with your customer. But once you get to 50 channels or definitely once you get to 100 channels, it is very difficult to keep an eye on what is happening, what issue, what are my open issues, um, Am I breaching any SLAs? Uh, so yeah, it's just very hard to scale those types of group group chats, group channels, community channels. So that is what we are focused on and building out. What would you say your biggest win so far? Like what are you most proud about from the Marvis journey? I would say that um, I'm I'm proud of the fact that we have been able to grow very quickly in the Web3 space over this past year, um, onboarded a lot of big projects, so companies like One Inch, Sushi, Sushi Swap. Cosmos, Nansen. Um, so we've got various customers that raised over like $100 million in VC funding. And yeah, again, also going back to what I just said before, the product is very sticky, so very little churn. So those are the things that I'm happy about. Awesome. And then you always had this great journey. and It seems like it was very intentional about going to different startups to learn your lessons first before going and doing your own thing. What are some of the things that you think that really stuck out that you're really glad you learned them at somebody else's company? Yeah, it was definitely intentional because when I was in uni and doing these internships, I had in my mind, I want to do my own startup, but I didn't feel ready. I didn't feel confident that I could do it. Looking back, you know, you learn so much on a job. I could have maybe done, I could have potentially done it. However, I'm still really happy that I did go through those other startups and those other experiences. Um, what did I learn? I would say a couple of things. One, uh, managing people, managing teams, it becomes easier over time and you learn how to deal with different different types of people, different types of personalities. So that was a good learning. Um, secondly, it's not really a learning, but building your network, it's just really, really important. And it's just so much easier to reach out to investors when you get a, can get a warm introduction, but building a network takes a bit of time. Um, in a city like London, you can definitely fast track it because there's so many events and so many communities, but still it takes, takes some time to build a network. Um, and lastly, I think this is more like mental or like emotional thing, which is that, um, sometimes people ask me if it's difficult to do a startup and be an entrepreneur. And to me, it is, of course, it can be challenging, but it's actually because I was the first employee in that previous company and we went through so many like very difficult moments. I've been as stressed in that company that wasn't my own company as I am in my current company because I think typically founders as a founder we have the, the type of personality anyway that we feel responsible and take ownership so in the previous company I also felt a lot of responsibility and we went through very very bad issues and because of the nature of the product being in banking if something goes wrong obviously the customer is going to be very angry. Um, so that just prepared me also just meant also yeah, that prepared me mentally to not take everything personally or not let it ruin my entire week. You know, if something bad happens, just breathe, get over it, um, move on. Uh, so and it, I think that also, yeah, was a big, was a big help in doing my own thing now. You mentioned there about the stress and it's part of being a founder. It's, it's so stressful. I have my own stress. And what keeps you going? What's, what do you love about what you do? I would say even though it's, even though it can be difficult or it can be stressful. What I like about being a founder is that you can take matters in your own hands more than you could when you're working for someone, because if I'm working for someone, I could still be very stressed or, but it would be even worse if I'm stressed and I cannot take the path that I think is going to be the best solution to, you know, get the results that we want. Let's say we're not, let's say the company is, for example, I'm working for someone, something isn't working or companies isn't doing well. 
I would be extremely frustrated if I have some ideas or some strategies that I think could improve things, but I can't do it. That would be more stressful <laughs> for me than at least, you know, being able to try to, to, to solve it, to do what I think is best. I think a lot of people can relate to that. I'm currently working at companies where they get frustrated at their management or the people above them. And it's great to see that you've now been able to transition from that build your own thing, go through a major pivot and everything's looking on the up as well. So we're now going to transition to the quick fire questions. The first question is who are three British stations that you think are doing incredible work that you'd love to shout out that the audience should be paying attention to? I will start with my friend Amber, who is running a company called Salmo. And what she is working on is helping uh, or she's digitizing the visa process. So helping people get visa, settle in the UK. It's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of paperwork. So I think she's doing amazing work. Um, second, uh, shout out to um, another friend, uh, Nina Mahanti, who is running a company called Bloom. And what she's focused on is helping immigrants and minorities save money and build wealth in ways that work for them. Um, yeah, so I think very, very important and very interesting company. And um, last, I'll give a shout out to one of the portfolio companies of or one of my fellow port seed camp portfolio companies, uh, which is um, Yonder, founded by Tim, um, who is building a um, new, who's building a credit card to give us all much better rewards than we can get with the likes of Amax. <laughs> so Tim and Nina have been on the podcast before, so like they're amazing, love them. And Amber, I'm pretty sure I'm talking to at the moment in my LinkedIn DM somewhere. So it's great to hear that from you. And the next question is, how can people find out more about you and more about what Marva is up to? So if you want to find find more about me, so um, my name is Iris Antaya, or if you search Iris Marva, you'll definitely be able to find me on like a, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, our website is mava.app, so do check it out if you're interested in learning more. And is there anything that the audience could help you today, that maybe somebody listening could reach out to you and help you with what you're doing, or Marva? Two things. One is we are currently raising, so... Um, yeah, if you want to learn more about that, reach out. Seconds, um, very much exploring, as I mentioned, going into new verticals, doing research in B2B SaaS. So if you are running a community, um, ideally in the software space, or but even any community, I uh, would love to chat. So thanks so much for coming on today. Have you got any final words to the audience? Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me and um, looking forward to seeing this live. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.